bitch mother in a church hat clap Man, that sugar gave her color purple coming back clap uh, When that whole week beat you up and stress you But you hear that organ playing and remind you of your blessings And on another note, she just hit another note Chills down my spine, got me crying, make me overload You don't know if that is dope Old school church hymns, deacons get the humming Now the drum up in the first hand Can you hear me now? Church close, swear they don't care
everybody. Would you stand with us if you are able? It's good to be together in the house this morning. Would you raise your hands with me as we give God what he deserves this morning? Lord Jesus, we come to you today how we're designed to be. We come to worship you. We come to praise you and we come to honor you. And Father God, we declare right at the start of this service that we will fix our eyes on things of you. Father God, that we would look above for where our help comes from this morning. That we would lay down our feelings, our thoughts, our worries, Father God. And we just invite your perfect peace, your joy to come and fill us this morning. We love you so much, Jesus. And you deserve all of this worship that we're going to give you. In your precious name, amen. Are we ready to worship?
Psalm 24 says this. It says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place, the one who has clean hands 
and a pure heart who doesn't trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek Him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is He, the King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. This psalm was written by David at a time where the Ark of the Covenant, the physical representation of the presence of God, was being brought back into the city of Jerusalem. And to enable to the, the Ark to enter the city, the gates of the city wall would have to be literally lifted up so that the presence of God could enter in. There was something even in the construct of the city that had to adopt a posture of praise in order for the presence of God, the King of glory himself, to enter in. I don't know about you, but I don't just want to do church this morning. I don't just want to do Christian karaoke. I want to have an encounter with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who created the heavens and the earth, the one who is sovereign over all his works, the one who made the earth and everything in it. We have the opportunity to encounter him in a real way this morning. And I reckon an appropriate posture for us is a posture of praise where we lift up our heads, we lift up our hearts, we lift up our hands towards the heavens and say, King of glory, come into my life. King of glory, come into my circumstance. King of glory, come into my situation. Because the presence of God no longer is reserved just for one city in one place. The presence of God is available and accessible to us all this morning. So I reckon we just need to sing that chorus one more time and say, Jesus, we welcome you in this place. We welcome you in this place. We're not here just going through the motions, but we want to welcome the King of glory in this place. So come on, let's lift up our voices, lift up our hands, lift up our heads, O ye gates, and let's welcome in the King of glory together. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you. Father, this morning, we welcome you in this place. We say, Holy Spirit, presence yourself amongst us in a real, tangible, and life-transforming way. Father, we choose right at the start of our time together to shut out the distractions, to silence the voices that would disrupt our confidence in you. And we say, you are welcome in this place. We lift up our heads. We lift up the gates of our own hearts and lives that may have been keeping you at bay. And we say, you are welcome to do what you want to do 
and have your way in us and have your way through us today. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said. All God's people said. Amen, amen. It's good to see you in the house today. Good to have you watching in on the live stream if you're watching there. I am wearing green in solidarity with my South African friends in the room. Any South Africans amongst us? Yeah, they're, they're all together in that corner up there. Look at them. Look at them. They don't make noise all year round. And then one rugby tournament. Rugby doesn't really mean all that much, if we're honest. And they suddenly find their voice. Good to, good to see you. Good to have you all. Hey, uh, we are going to now send our wonderful live kids out to their program. Um, so if you are primary school age and you've signed in for our live kids program, follow people in yellow t-shirts, waving big hands. We have a lion to follow as well somewhere in the room. And uh, you can be dismissed and go and enjoy your program. For the rest of us, why don't we turn around and just welcome a few people nearby, give someone a handshake, maybe a hug. Okay, once you've made at least a couple of people feel at home today, why don't you grab your seat and uh, we're going to have a great day together in the house. We got not just one preacher this morning, but three preachers that I'm going to introduce you to a little bit later on. But it uh, really is good to see you start of this half term week. Good to see the house pretty much full as well. But uh, just before we move on this morning, we're going to introduce a few guys up to share some of what they've been involved in on mission. <laughs> no idea what that was that ran across the front of the stage there. But we're going to invite a few guys up who have been on mission for us in India. Aren't you grateful to be part of a church that isn't just committed to being a blessing here in Bedworth, but our heart is to even be part of what God is doing right across the earth uh, just this week, we've sent out a team to Serbia. They landed safely yesterday, and they're going to be working over there with our missions partners in Novi Sad over the next week or so. Uh, Jim and Andy have arrived over the border in Ukraine. They're still driving towards Pastor Daniel in Mahanets, who we support over there, with two van full, van fulls? vans full, that's what I'm looking for, uh, of medical aid about about £80,000 worth of stock going over to be a blessing to people over there, which is remarkable. They, they've landed and they are still heading there. We need to continue to pray protection over them. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we also had Adrian and Jamie and Graham over in India visiting our missions partners and uh, launching uh, a medical van that's going to be a blessing to rural communities out there as well. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Adrian and the guys up to just come and share what they were involved in. So give them a round of applause as they come. And we'll hear a bit about that. Thank you, Danny. Brilliant. Well, we had quite an incredible time in India um, with uh, my son, of course, and Graham. Uh, it was quite, quite an experience, and, and we connected with Pastor John, who you've heard me talk about, uh, part of Bethsaida Gospel Ministries, um, located in Bongir, which is a rural area 50 miles outside of Hyderabad City. Um, 355 villages in the area there. And they provide social care, children's home, medical camps, pastor support, leprosy care, sewing center. Um, their heart is to reach out to the poor and with the gospel, but through all of these uh, programs. So it was, it was quite a time, wasn't it? You just see in the background some of the scenes of uh, what went on. I'm just going to ask these two. We called ourselves the Three Amigos because they, they, they gave us... They gave us these uh, outfits that we, you'll probably see in some of the scenes. And uh, yeah, it was funny. Give us a highlight. Yeah, um, 
again, it was a great time. It was very good for me to see a different part of the world, definitely. Um, and <laughs> there was such amazing children, and it was great to not only build a relationship with them, but so many other people. Um, but yeah, my highlight, I loved hanging out with the, the children, playing sports with them, but also um, going to yeah, different rural villages, churches there, and just to see the <laughs> see the passion of people um, for God and yeah, being able to pray for people too. Um, there was a lot of that, but you know, I was kind of, we all had to step out a lot, didn't we? Um, so it was a challenge for me, myself, and both of us, but um, yeah, really great opportunity. Great to get to know people, experience a different culture, but yeah. Well, first of all, it was wonderful to share our yeah. time, Jane and Adrian. It was great, great. Uh, I've been to India four times, um, and I know that, um, John's family, and it's amazing that we've tied up, isn't it? It's, it's, a, it's a miracle, really. And Jesse Paul, who is, I don't think he's with us this morning, uh, but he's part of this family. Um, and, and I think, Victor, you are from that area, aren't you? Uh, from Hyderabad. Uh, so... Uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's uh, every time I've been in the past, I've gone sort of on my own. So it's been great to team up with with you as a church. Um, so it was fabulous, fabulous. I'll just share something that uh, um, about a, a week or two weeks before I went to India, uh, I pulled, uh, we were going down the motorway and we pulled in at this service station, uh, me and Sheila. And um, I was she'd gone into the toilet and I was just waiting there. And there was all these Indian people suddenly teamed in to the to the service station, and and they were all. Uh, when I went outside, there was two double decker buses that I just pulled in, and and they were all waiting uh, to go to the toilet, you know. And there was this massive queue, and I thought, I'm, I'm wondering if this God is trying to tell me something really, and uh, and it never occurred to me while I was in India, but I, I think it's probably a message for us as a church that there's all these people with needs in India. Um, and we saw some of the needs, didn't we? You know, um, they, were, you know we, they say around every corner in India, there's a different story. Um, there's great needs. One in four of the world's poor comes from India. Uh, I think 850,000 people, uh, sorry, children under the age of five die every year in India uh, from preventable diseases. Um, so to partner, partner up with with these people is just wonderful. They have such great needs, uh, but they also have such wonderful hospitality. They just open the houses to you and you just feel humble. Uh, and the Christian church there, I'm, I'm sure, um, the, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, is San, this is Sancho, he was a star, Sancho. He was, he was, he was uh, making us dance, wasn't he, every, every night. Um, so, yeah, and uh, the numbers involved, um, the, if you look at the official statistics, uh, it's 2.5% are Christian, or nominated as Christian in India. But we were talking to the, to the pastors, and the, um, uh, there's open discrimination against Christians in, in India. So if you tick the box that you're a Christian, you miss out on educational grants and various other uh, government things. So because people are so poor, they don't tick the Christian box. And he reckons that there is probably in the region of about 15% of the population, 15 to 17.5% of the population of 1.4 billion are Christians. Now, if you, in, in numbers, that is over 200 million. And there's 65 million in, in, in uh, Great Britain, isn't it? So there's more Christians in India than there is. You know, and it's just so populous. So I think... Uh, the Christian church in India, it, it just needs, you know, so much support. Uh, and, um, you know, let, let's hope that God blesses uh, the needs of the church in India. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Graham. You know, the medical camp that uh, we were there for, they were expecting 50 to 100 and over 250 came. Um, the amazing thing is these rural villages, you've seen some scenes of it, uh, how do they advertise? Um, well, there's a guy who stands with the drum, the town crier of, of, of the village, who said there's this medical camp, and, and they all came. It was extraordinary. Um, and, you know, their vision is to do a camp every month, 
Um, so, you know, 200, two or 300 people per month, and that's 5,000 in a year. You know, it's such huge vision and heart. And, and the kids' uh, center that we were at, we stayed at, 25 beautiful kids, all with a story, as Graham said. Um, you know, BJ, age eight, was found in a railway station, couldn't provide any details about his parents at all. And even further efforts to trace fail to locate them, so he's in the home. Krishna, age nine, his mother, blind, father handicapped, they used to beg for food, slept in a bus shelter. He's in the home, being educated, trained. They take these kids right through to train them so they can uh, make a profession. Sanjay, the little boy you saw uh, dancing, his father used to beat his mother daily. He would see that. He's four now, so that was when he was two and three. She died of cancer. His older brother was on his way back with some money or something and he was late and his father was so angry in his drunken state he attacked him with a knife police were called and the police brought Sanjay to the center uh, now Pastor John has taken him on as guardian of, of Sanjay incredible stories 25 kids their vision would be to extend the, set, the home to be able to have 50 boys and, and provide facilities for girls there's so much need um, so much opportunity and yet such a joy to, to hook up and link and I'm just going to finish by reading a, a, a letter which John sent, a very quick letter, um, which just is thanks to everybody. He says, we thank you from the bottom of our heart for partnering with BGM India. We had a blessed time with the visit of Adrian Hines, Graham Dawson, and Jamie Hines. We had a great time with them in the medical camp, orphanage, and other things in India. We want to thank you and all the Life Church team for your prayer and support towards us. We expect this partnership to grow in leaps and bounds in the extension of his kingdom. You are a part of that. Through your giving uh, as a church, you are a part of the blessing that we are able to bring to that poor area in India. So, so thank you as John thanks you from the bottom of his heart. And I do just have a little gift which he brought you, Dan Danny and Naomi, <coughs> which maybe you can wear next Sunday. But this is a plaque which was just to... Uh, presented to Danny and Naomi. Um, Naomi, this was sewn by uh, Pastor John's wife as part of the sewing center, so maybe you can wear that next Sunday. <laughs> How about this for Danny? Look at that. Yes. There's trousers as well, Danny. <laughs> So, thank you guys. These guys were incredible. We were in fits of laughter, I tell you. Yeah. The, the, when we went and we stood on the stage and I said to Jamie, you'll be sign dancing, he, he thought I was joking. The first day when we got there and they put on a program, we weren't expecting three seats, oh cracky. And John, Pastor John said, have you got a song you could do? Oh, oh, we, no, no, we haven't. And Jamie said, you, can you remember the words of Awesome God? I thought, no. And then this young man said, oh, I've got a sheet of paper in my bag from a song, not a Christian song, John, Johnny Nash, and he starts singing it. We're, so, so we're all singing it. And then he's got these crazy actions. But the, the kids loved it. I tell you, we were in fits of laughter. It was such a blessing. Thank you all. Bless you. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Jamie. That was a bit of a different missions update, wasn't it? What do you think? Come. Oh, I broke it already. Catch that quick. Saw it on later. Thank you. Um, wonderful. We're gonna give. <laughs> we're gonna give right now, and uh, the details should come up on the screen behind me. We're gonna give us part of our worship because it's an act of worship. But uh, I hope you realise that here at Life Church, when it comes to giving, we we don't view the resource that comes in as something to be contained as though it's in a reservoir for a rainy day. 
We're not just saving up for when the boiler breaks, but actually we view all the resource that God blesses us with as a river through which we can bless other people in other places because we've got a big vision. We want to transform our towns. We want to reach our region. We want to win our world. And things like we're doing in India, Serbia, Ukraine, Kenya, all kinds of things could not be done without the generosity of God's people being obedient to God first but also being a part of what God is doing right across the earth. So we're ready to give, aren't we, church? Because we're a generous people committed to what God is doing. Naomi is not enjoying what I'm wearing, so I think I will take this off in the next song. But come on, church, let's stand together and let's, uh, let's give as we worship. Amen. generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all have gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. For your name is the highest in your name is the greatest in your name, stands above them all, above all thrones and dominions, it's all powers and positions in your name, stands above them all, and the angels cry, holy, all creation cries. Holy, you are lifted high. Holy, holy forever. And if you've been forgiven, and if you've been redeemed, sing the song. Greatest in your name stands above the 
We declare this morning, Lord, that you are holy. We join with the eternal choir of heaven and we say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We declare that you are set apart. There is no one like you, that your name indeed is the highest. Your name indeed is the greatest. There is no one like you. Father, we thank you this morning that people will not bow down to the name of Putin, Zelensky, Hamas, Netanyahu, Macron, Sunak, Trump, Biden. Father, we thank you that there is no name like Jesus. That it's the name of Jesus that has all power and all authority that it's at the name of Jesus that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess in heaven on earth and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord because you and you alone are holy you're perfect in all your ways you're perfect in all you do you are like no other and you and you alone are worthy of all our praise and all our worship. So we choose to put you in your rightful place this morning. We choose to lean in and listen. We thank you that a God who is so vast and is so other is also so near and is so close and wants to speak to each and every one of us this morning. So speak by your Holy Spirit, according to your word today, we pray in Jesus' precious, powerful name. Amen. 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 Well,
why don't we thank the worship team for leading us so well this morning. Thank you, guys. And uh, you can take your seats. As I said earlier, we don't have one preacher this morning. We're going to be blessed by three preachers. Uh, you may have heard me say before that we run something a few times through the year called Preaching Collab, where we're just developing people who feel they might have a calling or a gifting in the area of preaching or speaking or communicating. And if you remember, we had a few members from our Collab share back in June, July perhaps, and uh, we've got three more they are going to stand before you and share with you what God has put on their heart today. So are we ready to receive? we got open hearts, open eyes, open mind, open ears, open everything. And uh, open your notebooks and your Bibles if you've got one as well. And let's really lean in and receive what I believe God wants to say to us through each of these three individuals. So it's going to be a tag team. One's going to come up and then literally tag the other person on. And we're going to have Lorna, then we're going to have Jack, and then we're going to have Helen as well, bringing it home. So can we give them all a huge collective round of applause? But let's welcome Lorna up as she comes first. Thank you, Lorna. Let me read you a few comments I've had written about me in my past. Lorna's work is usually good, but she can sometimes seem confused. Lorna always does her best, but she finds some aspects of this subject hard. Lorna has made an effort this term. I hasten to add Lorna always made an effort every term, but she does not find French easy. And to be honest, you could swap that for Spanish, Latin, physics, chemistry, biology, maths, art, you name it. These are comments from my secondary school report book. If I tell you it's dated 1977 to 81, I'll leave you to guess how old I am. Um, I don't know why I've kept it, because most of the comments within it are similar to those I've just read to you. Now, these comments have one thing in common, a little three-lettered word, which has probably become my most hated word, the word but. It doesn't matter how positive my school report might have been about my efforts, my attention was always caught by that one word. And I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person for who the phrase, I was always waiting for the but, is true. However, notice I don't use the word but, however, <laughs> as much as I dislike the word, I realise that actually it's quite convenient. We can use it as an excuse. I was on track to meet the deadline, but then I got asked to do something else. I, was, I did my best, but it was just too much for me. There's a passage of scripture in which what could have been an attitude of but became one of nevertheless. So I've entitled this short talk, An Alternative Attitude, That of Nevertheless. I got some alliteration. I couldn't quite get it across the whole lot. In Luke chapter 5, we have the story of Jesus getting into Peter's boat. And in verses 4 to 7, in the New King James Version, it reads, When he'd stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they'd done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Now let me put this story into context for you. Peter has been in his family business with his brother as fishermen. Now, if you go to Mark chapter 1, verse 20, it suggests that this wasn't some small business. They had hired men which meant they were probably pretty successful uh, as, as, as fishermen. But on that night, things were a little bit different. They'd caught nothing, nada, zilch, not even a teeny-weeny gudgeon, which is all I ever caught when I did fishing when I was younger. Now, G Peter had met Jesus at least once before. We know this because if you go to the previous chapter in Luke chapter 4, Jesus comes to his home, and it's where he heals his mother-in-law. But we need to remember that at this point, Jesus has not chosen his disciples. Now, on the morning of this story, I suspect Peter was probably not in the best of moods. He probably just wanted to sort the nets out, 
clean the boat, and go home to bed. But without asking, Jesus gets into his boat. Now, I have to admit, if I was Peter, I would probably be a little bit peeved at this point. He gets into my boat without asking. He asks me to put out so he can speak to people for I don't know how long. Doesn't he know the night I've just had? And on top of this, Peter could have had no end of buts as to why he shouldn't go out and fish when Jesus told him to go out deeper. But I'm a trained fisherman. I know what I'm doing. Last night was just one of those occasions. But I've fished all night. I know that's the best time to fish. The fish come into the shallower water. It's easier. But we never fish in the day or that far from the shore. Yet I'll admit it, the fish are deeper at that time of the day. But it's, it's not good for the fishermen. It's scorching hot. And actually, it's not good for the boats either. Because being out in the middle of the lake, we're no longer protected by the shallower water. And we're not protected by the land features around the lake. But I, as an experienced fisherman, have caught nothing. So what makes you think that you as a carpenter can tell me how to fish? Plenty of buts. And let's face it. When Jesus asks us to do things, we have our fair share of buts. Maybe you've heard yourself saying one of these, but I tried that before and it didn't work. But I po couldn't possibly do that. I don't have the skills, I don't have the confidence, I don't have the resources, I don't have the time. And probably my worst one on my worst days, but why me? However, Peter chose to display a nevertheless attitude. And his response to Jesus brings a huge haul. So what changed for him? And what does it say about changing our attitude? I believe his use of the word nevertheless was a key moment that turned what could have been a dreadful day into his most positive if you think about it, as a friend pointed out to me, and I'm very pedantic about words, nevertheless must mean always the more. Nevertheless equals always the more. And why did this miracle happen for Peter? I, think it's, I believe it's because he didn't allow his excuses, his feelings, his circumstances to prevent him from saying nevertheless to Jesus. He chose to say nevertheless to the one who is always the more. Let me share one of my experiences of you of, of saying nevertheless to Jesus, which hopefully might encourage you. In my past, I was an infant school head teacher, and then I went on to become a school advisor up in Nottingham. Now, after several years of being a school advisor, I was asked to swap teams. I was to become, listen for this one, the advisor for the achievement of vulnerable groups. Try and put that on a name badge. Our team had been slimmed down and they wanted to keep one advisor in that team and move one over. Now, I knew my colleague would make life incredibly difficult if they asked her to move. And they knew it too. So guess who they asked? Me. Now, I looked at the job description and I must admit, at that point, I wanted to throw up. It was... Like, what do I know about all this? I was expected to now manage the achievement of minority ethnic children, children at home educated, um, gifted and talented, and the big part of my job was running the virtual school for looked after children. I knew very little about these areas. But I prayed, and I felt God saying that he was the one who was asking me to move. So what could I do? I had to say... <laughs> So, um, I feel well out of my comfort zone here, Lord. Nevertheless, I will do what you ask. Now, I'm not going to tell you it was a bed of roses when I did it, because it wasn't. It was still hard work. I had to stand up in front of political leaders and explain why, you know, why our children weren't doing as well um, as uh, they should have. But I got to meet a whole load of people from different teams that I would not have met before who I believe God put into my path when later he asked me to give it all up to become a foster carer. Through all of this, God did give me more. 
but maybe not as I expected. He gave me more compassion, empathy, and commitment to the vulnerable, which if I'd stayed in my original role, I would not have got. The Jesus who turned the less of water into the more of wine, the one who took the less of five loaves and two fishes and produced the more of 12 baskets of leftovers, and he who himself said nevertheless to his father in the garden of Gethsemane when he prayed for the death he was about to endure to be taken away, I can say I know like Peter he is in my boat and he has definitely turned my less into more. And I know he's offering the same to you today. So as I close, I'm reminded of a song sung by Dana Washington called What a Difference a Day Makes. I would suggest what a difference a word makes. So I ask you today, will you change your but for nevertheless and let he who is always the more into your boat? Maybe you need to take that first step of actually letting Jesus into your boat Peter's life was changed dramatically when he let Jesus in, and yours will be too. And when you have him in your boat, maybe like me, you need to change your excuses. Get rid of your attitude of but, and say to him, nevertheless, I will do as you ask. Who knows what haul he has waiting for you? Who knows what changes he's waiting to make in your life. Because when you say nevertheless, his response is always the more. Let me repeat that. When you say nevertheless, his response is always the more. So I encourage you to make the day, today the day that you have an encounter with Jesus and you take up that alternative attitude of nevertheless. It changed Peter's life. I can vouch that it's changing mine, and I have no doubt it will change yours too. Well, hello, hello, hello. Um, can we just give another round of applause for Lorna? That was amazing. Thank you so much, Lorna, for sharing that. Um, and what a privilege it is to stand in front of you and, and share today. Uh, and so I just want to pray before I start. Um, so if you can pray with me, that would be amazing. Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity to stand up here and share what I believe to be is your word, God. So I pray as I speak, Father, that it is you speaking and not me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. So for those that don't know me, my name is Jack. I'm 34 years old. I like Harry Bow, dad jokes, and drums. Okay? And I am a little bit, I'm still sad, in fact, that the McDonald's McSpicy doesn't taste as good as it used to. Um, I harbor a little bit of unforgiveness there, uh, but that's okay. God is working that out in me. Um, and so for those that might not have gleaned from that short little intro there, I'm a bit weird. Um, and so in keeping with the weirdness, I'm going to start from the end. Is that okay? Yeah, and uh, it's just something that I feel like God has really put on my heart this week while preparing this message. And it is simply this. God has plans to prosper you, not to harm plans to prosper and not to harm. And he has plans for hope and a future for you. Danny brought an amazing message uh, to us last week, which was called Hope When Things Seem Hopeless. Uh, he said that we need a firm faith, we need faithful friends, and we need a fixed focus. So for those that might be taking notes today, I'm going to do it a little bit differently. I'm going to give you the first half of my title now and the second half in a little bit. Okay, I told you I was weird. So the first half is simply this. Be like Cliff. Profound. No, of course it's not. Jack, you're a bit weird. No, it doesn't make any sense. I'm going to tell you right now. 
Okay, be like Cliff. And it is this. On a sunny day in 1983 in Sydney, Australia, began the Sydney to Melbourne Ultra Marathon. Okay, this was a 600 mile foot race that took place over more than seven days. Okay, and uh, it's the ultimate test of stamina and endurance. And on this day, as all the experienced runners were getting ready with their um, professional gear, runners in their 20s, 30s, maybe some in their 40s, uh, prepping themselves in their good shoes, you know, shorts and top and all of that. I don't run, as might be completely obvious. Um, in walks Cliff Young. Cliff Young, a 61-year-old farmer wearing a cotton T-shirt, construction boots, and rubber trousers in case it rained. Okay, not only that, but he poked holes in his rubber trousers for ventilation. Okay, that's top-tier stuff. Okay, um, he was asked before the race, have you ever raced before? He said, no. So you've decided to run a seven-day race? Yes. Why? They asked. Well, I had some free time in my schedule and thought I've always wanted to run a race. Um, have you ever run a marathon? No. Have you ever trained? No. Have you ever had a trainer? No. So here was this guy that before the race had even started, everyone had discounted and put to the side as just a random guy. So the race begins and runners, as I'm sure they would do in a race like this, they start off, okay, and they, you know, like a run. Everyone knows how to run, okay? But then there's Cliff, and Cliff started off like this. It later became known as the Cliff Young Shuffle, okay? And you know what happened? He went, fell straight to the back, straight to the back, as I'm sure you can imagine, and he fell so far behind, in fact, that by the end of the first day, he had completely lost all other runners. All of them were out of sight and, I'm sure, out of mind at this point. But here's what people didn't know. Cliff had grown up and spent most, if not all, of his life on a farm. 2,000 acres of farmland. And he had 2,000 sheep. Okay, but you see, his family wasn't wealthy enough to um, own the things that would make it easy to do the job on the farm. Things like horses or tractors or anything like that. So Cliff spent his days chasing after his 2,000 sheep on foot. Um, and when a storm would come in, his job would be to collect all the sheep to keep them safe. And he would, it would be normal for him to be out for 24 hours at a time, straight r running through the fields, collecting his sheep. <coughs> so Cliff, having never run a race before, didn't know that most of these runners were going to run for 18 hours and sleep for six. And he'd fallen so far behind that by the time he reached where all of the other runners were sleeping, Cliff didn't know they were in there. And so Cliff just shuffled along and shuffled straight past them. Cliff ran non-stop for five days. And he won the Sydney to Melbourne Ultra Marathon. <laughs> But here's the thing, not only did he win, he beat the existing record by two whole days. <laughs> two whole days. And so this brings me to the second part of the title of my message. Be like Cliff, prepared in the field. You see, what Cliff might have considered lack what the world often tells us is a disadvantage, what he might have considered lack, not being able to have those things, was what cultivated his biggest strength. And so I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know your struggles. 
I don't know the field you might be in or the storm that might be raging around you, but God does. And so often our prayer is, God, save me from this hurt. Save me from this pain. Save me from this season. But God didn't save Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fire. He saved them in the fire. He didn't save Daniel from the lion's den. He saved him in the lion's den. God has plans to prosper you and not to harm. Plans to give you a hope and a future. That's a verse from Jeremiah 29. And I just want to share with you a verse from Proverbs 3. Verses, uh, what is it, 5 to 6. It says this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. So my prayer for us this morning is that we will come to see the amazing plans that God has for us. And whilst we may be being prepared in the field, we will have a fixed focus on him. Not leaning on our own knowledge, but trusting in him fully. Thank you so much for listening, guys. I'm going to hand over to the amazing Helen. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So I was always a bit nervous about going last because I thought, Flip, what if Laura and, Laura and Jack are on it and I'm just kind of completely off it and say something completely different? But actually, I think it fits in. Whew. That's lucky. <laughs> Feeling quite lucky. Right. I just want to, the look of the Lord, yeah. I just want to read from you, from Galatians. This is another point as well with the lights and my glasses where I could actually see the Bible. But we're going to go for it. Okay, so Galatians 18. I don't know if you want to just get your Bibles or you want to just listen. But I um, just want to read this passage to you. And it says, God appeared to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance of his tent. It was the hottest part of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing. He ran from his tent to greet them and bowed before them. He said, Master, if it please you, stop for a while with your servant. I'll get some water so you can wash your feet. Rest under this tree. I'll get some food to refresh you on your way, since your travels have brought you across my path. They said, certainly, go ahead. Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. He said, hurry, get three cups of our best flour, knead it and make bread. Then Abraham ran to the cattle pen and picked out a nice plump calf and gave it to the servant who lost no time in getting it ready. Then he got curds and milk, bought them with, with the calf that had been roasted, set the meal before the men and stood there under the tree while they, while they ate. So... We, uh, so as a family, we like um, hosting people, and we have a bit of a uh, policy in our house, and it's always, there's always room for one more. There's always room for one more around the table. Um, but um, I do kind of like a little bit of notice, so we can do a little bit of preparation. It is fortunate that, you know, in our time, we can nip to Tesco's, of which we often have on the way home, nip to Tesco's just to make the table a bit fuller, so that we've got a bit more food. But, you know, uh, this passage kind of amuses me um, because Abraham, you know, is sitting outside his tent or his house in his yard and three strangers come by. And I kind of think that Abraham must have sensed some significance with those strangers. And um, so he's saying to them, you know, stop and let me wash your feet because it's been a, a long journey. And you think, yeah, okay, that's fine. I can get. I could. I could get a bucket of water. I could get a towel. I could wash um, these feet. That's that. That's kind of okay. That's quite straightforward. And then he says, um, "Come in and oh, let, let let me prepare some food for you so you can eat." And and I was thinking, oh, okay, all right. But it's not just a, a cheese sandwich that he's thinking of preparing. No, he's committing to a full-on roast. And, uh, and I'm just imagining the scene. So he goes running into his tent and he's going, Sarah, 
Sarah, we've got some guests for dinner. I want you to bake the best bread. Get your best flour out. None of this Aldi nonsense. No, we need to go to Waitrose. Get the best flour from Waitrose and make that bread. And then I can imagine him saying, going to the field and choosing this calf. And then saying, hey, you, we need to prepare this calf. Come on. And, the, and you know, the servant saying, oh, when, when do I need to prepare? Now. We need to prepare it now. And then you, you need to prepare some vegetables. We've got some guests coming for dinner. And, uh, and it just made me think that, um, you know, it could have been easy, wouldn't it? Uh, I wonder whether my attitude would have been, well, you invited them. You, you invited these guests. You can prepare the bread. You can go and get the flour. You can go and prepare the roast. But, but it didn't. Sarah was of the attitude that your guests are my guests. And I need to help in the preparations. You might have done the actual inviting, but I need to help in the preparations. And uh, it kind of got me thinking. Um, I, I don't know, uh, most of you were probably here on Wednesday night when we had our partners night. And uh, I was just sat there and listening to obviously the building project that we're looking to expand this building and make it bigger. And then I was looking at that crazy chart that went on. You remember that crazy chart that you thought, wow, okay, there's a lot going on there. Uh, and how that chart was going to support us for our growth. And I, and I just thought, you know what? Expansion is coming for dinner. Expansion is coming and we need to be ready. We need to be prepared. And, you know, it just made me think that Danny might have invited expansion in. He might have got the building project in. You know, but it's actually up to all of us to play our part. It's not just down to leadership team. It's not just down to staff team. We've all got to do something and we've all got to play our part. You know, someone has got to go and bake the bread. Someone has got to go and get that calf and start roasting it. Someone needs to go and get some vegetables. We've got expansion coming to dinner and it is hungry and there is some preparation to do. So um, during lockdown, we... Um, we had a little, uh, decided to do a little puzzle. We just thought, oh, it will just entertain us, be a bit uh, therapeutic during the, our lockdown season. So we started off with a 500-piece puzzle, um, which was, uh, okay, quite straightforward. We managed to do that. And then we thought we would uh, be brave and we would go to a 1,000-piece puzzle. Uh, just as a tip, I'm not a puzzler. I'm sure there are people in the room that do like puzzles. I'm not, but don't get one with loads of blue sky because it's really... <laughs> really, really hard. I'll just stick that down there a second. But um, one thing that I uh, founded, that I found do doing the puzzle is that um, it, took a it took a while, particularly with a thousand piece, to actually find the place that that piece fitted. It took a while. There was quite a bit of skirting it around the board, trying, oh, I think it fits, oh no, it doesn't, it fits there. And there was quite a, a bit of actual trying to make it fit. I never once picked out a piece of the puzzle and plopped it into place first time. Never once. I always had to move it around the board a little bit. And, you know, there, there are lots of different pieces here at church, and there are loads and loads of opportunities, particularly as our church gets bigger. But we just sometimes have to move around the board in order to find where we fit. And this is if you don't take anything else home from what I've said today, I really want you to take home this, is that we all have a place that fits. You know, I think it's important to know that since the devil cannot have us for his service, he seeks to render us ineffective for God's service. And every person within the body of Christ has a call to do ministry. And do not allow yourself to be fed the lie that you don't have a place that fits here. So in Ephesians 2 verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God saved us so that we can, he can use us for ministry. But as expansion comes, the picture is going to get bigger. And we may have a season of feeling a little bit uncomfortable and a little bit displaced whilst we find where we fit. But in Ephesians 4 16, it says this, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. At each, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. What an amazing picture that is. 
We are part of God's puzzle. And when your piece fits into place, it helps someone else's piece fit into place. It might just need a few moves around the board in order to make it fit. And I want to encourage you, a bit like what Lorna has said, to, to be someone that is prepared to move around the board. And if there is something that needs doing, I just want to encourage you to perhaps be the someone that fills the gap, to perhaps be the someone that, that does it. Um, I offered my services once to the car park team. They were sure, and I said, sure, I'll go on the car park rotor, that's fine. Uh, I went on the car park rotor, and after all, you know, the few cars that come in and they've all got a spot, because, you know, there's lines and they're all fine. And when it came to uh, the cars where you actually properly needed to do something, I thought, oh, okay, I'm on here. This is, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm good with this. And the first came, car came in, and it was someone that I knew. So we wound down the window, and we had a little chat for, a, for two or three minutes. Little did I know that whilst I'm chatting to this person, there's eight more cars that have come in, and they've just parked randomly around the car park, and there is real carnage going on. Um, needless to say, they've not actually asked me back on the car park again. But I would be prepared to go on the car park and cause carnage, just put that on record out there. But it's just sometimes there is a gap that needs filling. And actually, do you know what? The car park is probably not my fit, but I'll give it a go if there's no one else out there, you know. Um, and uh, everybody has a fit. But also, I just think we just need to remember that sometimes the fit isn't the same as what it was maybe two years ago or three years ago. You know, sometimes I think that uh, we think, well, I, I, used, I used to always sit in that seat over there. And I used to be on welcome. And everybody used to know my name. And now that we've got a bit bigger, um, I don't know. I feel a bit displaced. And I don't quite know where I fit. Because fit to me is when someone knows my name. And fit to me is when I'm on the welcome door, because that's what I've always do, done. And fit to me is, and we have a category of what we think fit is. And actually, I don't feel like I fit. And, um, but that does not mean that you don't fit. It just means the picture's got a whole lot bigger. That's all. And we've just got to move around the board and find our new fit. And God is a God of expansion. And he designed the church with a lot of pieces. Now, one thing that um, I didn't do when I had my puzzle was I never threw a piece away. I never got a piece out of the box and thought, oh, I just can't find a place where this goes. Uh, oh, just going to discard it. Just going to toss it away. Never, you, I didn't throw the piece away. And you're like, well, oh, that's crazy. Of course you wouldn't throw the piece away. Because you know that in the end, when the picture is complete, you know that there'd be a gap there'd be a gap missing, and that piece would be important. And so it's, it's just important that every piece has a place, and we just have to figure out where that place is. So just as I wrap up, you know, expansion is coming to dinner, and it's up to us to be the body of Christ, to prepare for its coming. Someone may shout to you, hey, I need you to go and get the bread. Hey, I need you to go and get the calf out of the field. I need you to go and prepare some reg vegetables. What would be your response? Are you someone who's prepared to say, yeah, I'll do that? You know, I, I kind of think we have got two responses at that stage, haven't we? We could just be someone that says, well, I didn't invite expansion in. I didn't invite that in. I'm quite happy as we are. I quite like one service. This 10.30 service suits me. I don't really need any more ministry. I'm quite happy with the ministries that we've got. Or will your response be, I'm prepared to get stuck in. Where do you need me? Okay, there's some room on the youth ministry team. Well, okay, I've not got kids at that age anymore, but I recognize somebody in the family has, and I recognize that's important, so I'll get stuck in. Tea and coffee, you've got a gap? Well, I like to disappear at the end of the service. Um, I'm, not very, I'm not very keen on tea. I don't drink coffee. I like to go home and get my lunch. But I recognize that there's people here that perhaps are lonely, that perhaps this is the only tea and coffee that they get to have with somebody. So sure, I'll make tea and coffee at the end of the service because I recognize there's somebody in the family that needs it. You know, expansion is coming, and it's our guest too. So how will you respond to the call to welcome it in? We are a church family and the responsibility falls to us all. God wants us to do something. He wants us to get our hands dirty, to get involved and to give it all. And my question is, will you get stuck in? 
So would you just stand with me, just as we just come in, and we're just going to head into our last part of worship. <clears throat> and as the worship team are just preparing, I'd just like us to consider this. Do you feel like you don't have a place that fits, or you don't have a place that fits anymore? You know, I want to renew your mind. Close your eyes and just renew your mind with the truth that we, you do have a place. I have a place that fits. You are a piece, and that piece is important and vital to the family that we have here. And if your piece is not put in the right place of the puzzle, the whole picture is not complete. So ask God, where do I fit? And if you are not sure, can I encourage you to have a go? There is a place and a peace for you.
Come on, church, let's give a clap of praise to a God who is good and whose goodness follows us. I don't know about you, but I was incredibly blessed by all that was shared by our three preachers this morning. Lorna, Jack, Helen, huge round of applause for these guys. You did brilliantly, brilliantly. I, I didn't give any of them a theme to speak from, but beautiful to see how God threads that together, hey? But God has a plan and a purpose for each and every single one of us. And even when we're going through seasons that don't make sense, he's often preparing us for that plan. And we've got a part to play in what God's doing here. I love that. Can you just give me that box again, that picture puzzle there, Helen? I love that because I just got a sense, even as you held it up, that this, oh, was it all together and I've just ruined it? But who, who knows that maybe our church one day will have a thousand individuals part of it. But there's a peace and there's a place reserved for you and for those still to come. And a part of our responsibility is not making excuses, as Lorna said right at the start. It's easy to find a book, but I don't belong. But there's nothing that really scratches my particular itch. No, no, come on. Nevertheless, if God asks us, let's be responsive to what he's saying to each of us individually in this season. So thank you all three for sharing so wonderfully well. Let's give them one more round of applause if you've not had enough. Um, just to mention a few things coming up. Uh, on Tuesday for our children, there's a light party happening here, uh, five till seven. I think there's still just about time to book in for that. If you'd love your child to come along to that, that's open to you. Uh, I want to invite Gemma quickly to come forward, if that's okay. Gemma's going to come and just tell us a little bit about something you can be involved in in the run-up to Christmas. Give Gemma a hand. I definitely forgot about this. Um, we are reuniting our choir for Christmas. Um, so it's open to all ages. So if you're interested in being a part of our choir, um, who have done a fantastic job over the last few years, I love having the choir. If you want to be part of that, um, you don't need to have like any grades of singing ability. It's open for all ages. Just come and chat to someone at Connections. I might try and be there. Um, and give your name and email address and we'll be in touch with more details. But it would be amazing to have you a part of that. Thanks, Gemma. Um, if you're new here this morning, we'd love to chat with you, connect with you before you leave. We've got a little bag of goodies to give you as well that'll give you some more information about the church. So on your way out to the left is our connections point. Uh, do check in with some of the guys there. And if you'd just love to give us your details, that'd really help us communicate with you and keep you up to date with all the many things going on within the life of the church that you can be involved in. Who's had a great Sunday in the house? I think we should go out with praise one more time. So stay standing. We're going to sing one final song. Then you can go and have a wonderful day. Whatever you're doing.
Cause you rose and defeated